Hey everyone, we're about ready to go. So if you are coming in for the Fairy Tales and Disability session, please join us. And we're going to roll in about a minute. So. Uh, Great. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mark Walker from AbilityNet. Um, I'm going to be your host uh, today for this session. And I'd like to introduce Hella. Could you tell us who you are and why you're here? Sure. Um, so I'm Hella Dertz. I'm uh, actually working in, at GLZ um, in uh, Germany, in Bonn, working for a project in Yemen. Um, but, um, but I've also studied literature, and um, that's why I'm very fascinated of having the session here and having the possibility to be with you two here on stage, and um, yes, looking forward to it, to have a good discussion. Um, my name is Heide Marie Ecke. I'm from the Austrian um, Committee, Monitoring Committee on the UNCRPD. And I am very passionate about inclusive storytelling and inclusive PR, and that's why I'm here, I suppose. And also, my name is Heidi, and we are going to talk about Heidi. <laughs> so, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to talk about um, how how disability is portrayed in stories, in particular fairy tales, and then the influence that has on how we perceive people with disabilities. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of examples that we're going to just read to you from just to set the scene. Um, and we want you to participate. There's a, a Slido. If you haven't come across Slido before, if you go to slido.com on your, on your phone, it works on the phone fine. Um, and there's a code on here, uh, number 110821. I'll say that again in a second if you get there. Um, what you can do on there is you can ask us questions, and then you can also see the other questions that are being asked as we go along. But we're also really interested in alternative endings to fairy tales, which will come clear as we talk through. So if you have ideas about how fairy tales uh, could have ended differently, and maybe in a more inclusive way, we're really interested to see what ideas you've got as we go along. So we're going to uh, start now, and then uh, I'm going to keep my eye on what's happening in the audience and every now and then we'll just check in and see if you've got any questions that are going to come up as we're going along. Cool. So, over to you, Helica. You're going to introduce The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Of uh, course. We, we have chosen The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, while I'm reading, you can just have a guess why. <laughs> uh, it's published in 1831. Uh, in, uh, in French as a Gothic novel by Victor Hugo. And it takes place in Paris in uh, 14, 1482, so quite old. Um, we have the main character with disability, which is Quasimodo, the bell ringer, for those of you who, um, who are slowly re um, remembering. And yes, um, I will now read like two passages. Um, just to get you into the mood of the, of the text, and then afterwards we talk about it. So I began with the description of Quasimodo focusing on his physical appearance. The strange visit visitors which came in turn to gnash their teeth in the rose window were like so many brands cast into the brazier. And from the whole of this ever ever whisking crowd, there escaped as from a furnace, a sharp, piercing, stinging noise, hissing like the wings of a gnat. Oh, hey, curse it. Just look at that face. It's not good for anything. That's the first passage. Now come the second one, where Quasimodo is telling La Esmeralda, other, char other character, that he is using sign language. Tell me, I must look to you like a beast. You, you are a ray of sunshine, a drop of dew, the song of a bird. I am something frightful, neither man nor animal. I know not what, harder, more trembled underfoot, and more unshapely than a pebbled stone. Then he began to laugh, and that laugh was the most heartbreaking thing in the world. He continued, yes, I am deaf but you should talk to me by gestures, by signs. 
I have a master who talks with me in that way, and then I shall very soon know your wish from the movement of your lips, from your look. Well, she interposed with a smile, tell me why you saved me. He watched her attentively while she was speaking. I understand, she replied. You ask me why I saved you. You have forgotten a wretch who tried to adapt you one night, a wretch to whom you ran that circle on the following day on the infamous pallery. A drop of water and a little pity that is more than I can repay with my life. You have forgotten that I, that, that wretch, but he remembers it. So, um, if it wasn't obvious before, I'm hopefully becoming a bit clearer about what we're going to be talking about and how disability is portrayed in stories. Um, so, Heidi, I'll, I'll start by you. What, what does that passage sort of make you think about, and in terms of your own sort of experience of inclusive storytelling and so on, where does this take us in terms of discussing this issue? So when we look at fairy tales or strong stories which, which are making our childhood or even our adulthood, um, they are shaping it, um, it, it's important to say that um, I am a woman with disabilities and I always was like the tall one, the different looking one, I'm cross-sighted. And when I hear the, the description of Quasimodo, I just remember that always I felt more drawn to these kind of descriptions than to these of the princesses. So um, that's uh, one thing I want to, to share with you, that if you're living with a disability and if you're looking a bit different than others and you're not in the normal concept, that's what you're drawn to and that's what you hear. And when you hear these kind of uh, stories and, and uh, explanations, you get drawn to that. And I've always felt more like uh, Quasimodo or the beast than, uh, um, than the princesses. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Hella, when you're reading that? What, what are you thinking about? I'm sharing your, your, your idea. I'm also, I have the same impression. And um, I always, when I'm reading these, um, these kind of stories, which are also a little bit older, I try to, um, to pose me in this situation and in the context and in the, in the year where it's taking place and looking at the people and just thinking, ah, what, what was their reaction towards it? And um, I can only remember different situations in my childhood where I was also um, uh, discriminated by... <laughs> I was I know I don't know I was standing at a swimming pool and there I was I was I was already in the wheelchair because I already did swimming and there were the children looking at me and running to me and saying ah oh, you aren't able to swim are you and that was like so then that fits very well in this description of uh, of Quasimodo that he is um, contextualized with a negative negative way and a negative way of thinking and being, not being useful. Right. And, and of course, we're talking about stories that we've all heard. The whole point about the fairy tale element, really, is that these are children's stories, in a sense. I mean, this is not only a children's story, but it's something that we heard very early on in life that becomes part of how we think about the world around us. And, and I guess that's the point for you in the sense of your own experience of it as well, that this is how you were treated and, and seen by others is because of those stories are amplifying that. Um, so the, 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 the work that you're doing, Heidi, in particular, around inclusive storytelling, where does that lead us with these sorts of stories? How does that, what's, what's, the, what's the remedy, if you like, or, or how do we begin to address these sorts of things in a story? Do we leave it as it is or do, and change the ending, or do we begin to work with the characters differently? Let's change everything, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not the costumes. Um, Yes, when we are looking into inclusive storytelling. So we, we learned with those kind of stories how a story has to be shaped. There is a good one, beautiful, but there is a villain often marked as villain, or there is a good one who is not beautiful, but has a very, very good heart. So it's just quite quite simple in the depiction of how life goes and there's always this good and not complex ending. So therefore I would say we need to change the stories we are telling. We need to portray 
Um, so the story, the fairy tale in it, the magic can be that we are depicting inclusive an inclusive society, and that would be a, a great way to create new fairy tales. Cool. And I, just to let you know, on Slido, you can tell us other ideas. And there's a question come in, which we'll come back to in a minute. Sorry, Mother, it's not on. Uh, we'll come back to the questions as we're going along. So do ask questions. They're starting to appear on Slido. It's really helpful for us to see that. So we're going to move on to the next example. Um, which is Heidi. Um, accidentally <laughs> at Heidi, <laughs> so Heidi was appointed to this panel after we'd chosen Heidi, by coincidence. But again, we're going to have a reading from Hella to help us set the scene. Yes, um, Heidi was one of my uh, favorite uh, stories I had in my childhood, I, I have to say, but we can talk later about, about this. Um, it is published in 1880 and 1881 in uh, in Germany um, by Johannes Biri, and it takes place in the Swiss Alps. And here also the main character has a disability, which is Clara. She's a homeschool um, primary um, um, girl and student. And yes, now I will read um, two passages, one is a little bit longer. Um, yes. Um, and you, you know that, that in, in this uh, story there is um, there's Heidi coming in, serving as a friend, let's say, um, for Clara. I, I don't have um, more arguments towards it right now, but just for you to know. And um, that's why I'm reading now out um, that Clara's dad just returned and Clara is stepping up for Heidi. And now, my dear little Clara, he said, drawing his chair nearer and laying her hand in his, answer my question clearly and intelligibly. What kind of animals has your little companion brought into the house? And why does Fräulein Rottenmeier think that she is not always in her right mind? Clara had no difficulty in answering. The alarmed lady had spoken to her also about Heidi's wild manner of talking. But Clara had not been able to put a meaning to it. She told her father everything about the tortoise and the kittens and explained to him what Heidi had said that the day Fräulein Rottenmeier had been put in such a fright. Herr Sesemann, his fa um, her father, um, laughed heartily at her recital. So you, don't, so you do not want me to send the child home again? He asked. You are not tired of, ha of having her here? Oh, no, no, Clara exclaimed. Please, please do not send her away. Time has passed much more quickly since Heidi was here, for something fresh happens every day, and it used to be so dull, and she always has so much to tell me. That's the first passage. Now, we are going much further in the story, um, nearly at the end. The wheelchair is missing. Um, but uh, that doesn't stop Heidi and grandfather to take Clara with them to the arm. Heidi now came, came running out of the hut and round to the shed. Grandfather was behind with Clara in his arms. The shed stood wide open, the two loose blanks having been taken down, and it was quite light inside. Heidi looked into every corner and ran from one end to the other, and then stood still, wondering what could have happened to the chair. Grandfather now came up. How is this? Have you wheeled the chair away, Hedy? I've been looking everywhere for it, Grandfather. You said it was standing ready outside, and she again searched each corner of the shed with her eyes. At that, at that moment, the wind, which had risen suddenly, blew upon the shed door and sent it begging back against the wall. It must have been the wind, Grandfather, exclaimed Heidi, and her eyes grew anxious at the sudden discovery. Oh, if it has blown the chair all the way down to Dorfli, we shall not get it back in time and shall not be able to go. If it has rolled as far that it will never come back, for it's in a, in a hundred pieces by now, said the Grandfather, going round the corner and looking down. But it's a curious thing, to have it happened, he added, as he thought over the matter, for the chair would have had to turn a corner before starting downhill. 
Oh, I'm sorry, lamented Clara, for we shall not be able to go today, or perhaps any other day. I shall have to go home, I suppose, if I have no share. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But Heidi looked towards her grandfather with her usual expression of confidence. Grandfather, you will be able to do something, won't you? So that it need not be, as Clara says, and so that she is not obliged to go home. Well, for the present, we will go up to the mountain as we had arranged, and then later on, we will see what can be done, he answered, much to the children's delight. He went indoors, fetched up the pole of shawls, and laying them down on the sunniest spot he could find, set Clara down upon them. Then he fetched the children's morning milk and had out his two goats. And it's going on further. Peter and Heidi assist Clara to walk. As soon as they got to Clara, Heidi gave her orders. Peter was to take ho um, hold of her under the arms on one side and she on the other. And together they were to lift her up. This first movement was successfully carried through. But then came the difficulty. As Clara could not even stand, how were they to support her and get her along? Heidi was too small for her arm to serve, Clara to, teen, to lean upon. You must put one arm well around my neck so, and put the other through Peter's and lean firmly upon it. Then we shall be able to carry you. Peter, however, had never given his arm to anyone in his life. Clara put hers in his, but he kept his own hanging down straight beside him like a stick. That's not the way, Peter, said Heidi in an authoritative voice. You must put your arm out on the shape of a ring and Clara must put through it and lean her weight upon you. And whatever you do, don't let your arm give away like that. I'm sure we shall be able to manage. Peter did as he was told, but still, they did not get on very well. Clara was not such a light white, and the team did not match very well in size. It was upon side and down the, down the other, so that the supports were rather wobbly. Clara tried to use her own feet a little, but each time drew them quickly back. Put your foot down firmly, one suggested Heidi. I'm sure it will hurt you less after that. Do you think so? said Clara hesitatingly, but she followed Heidi's advice and ventured one firm step on the ground and, the, uh, and, and then another. She called out a little as she did it. Then she lifted her foot again and went on. Oh, that was less painful already, she exclaimed joyfully. Try it again, said Henny encouragingly. And, Clyde, and Clara went on putting one feet after another until all at once she called out. I can do it, Heidi. Look, look, I can make proper steps. And Heidi cried, uh, cried out with even greater delight. Can you really make steps? Can you really walk? Really walk by yourself? Oh, if only grandfather were here. And she continued gleefully to exclaim, you can walk now, Clara, you can walk. It's a miracle. So um, what do you, does that make you think, Hello, when you're reading that? So remind us, so Heidi is, uh, uh, lives in the mountains. She's this almost like mythical child, isn't she? She's almost given magic there. She's, she's magically allowed Clara to walk. And do you remember reading about that when you were younger and how that, how that story jumped out at you? Yeah, so the story was really personal for me because I, I really was, was um, in the story when I was hearing and reading it. And... Um, and I, I was really in this fantasy of this cat could be come through. So I went to my mother um, for several times asking her that, yeah, mama, then I could do it like Heidi and Clara and then tomorrow I can, I can walk as well, won't I? And my mother, of course, what, uh, didn't know what to say, um, but I had uh, such, a, such a strong uh, will in this that this could happen, yeah. and um, I think this is something what, what children need, are need, um, also are learning in their childhood, that it, these are f 
that these are fairy tales and stories, um, but for them in a, chi in a childhood, it's real. Mm. And it's not um, something in, a, in the fantasy. So, um, and um, I think that's something what really is important also for children, because children, be, children are learning why, why they are playing, why they are hearing stories. And um, that this process of learning and um, discovering the world. So um, I really like it, and I really like the the way um, Heidi is treating Clara because this is the other way around. Heidi is not seeing the disability of Clara; she's just seeing her as a normal girl and a normal friend, um, um, which she. Um, not only wants to support, I think the support isn't that focused, but she really wants to to play with her and to be with her. Mm. And it's only uh, it's only when the uh, adults step back that the child gets to play with her as well, isn't it? That's a, a, a moment in the story where Heidi changes the story because the adults yeah. have stepped back and said it's not possible and she's made it. Yeah, happen. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the parental home is just protecting her, not seeing anything, not good, but not seeing anything special in her, and then Heidi came and somehow really um, transferred the, the life into something positive. And, yeah. uh, and I think this is something that we also can relate it to, to independent living, which is our, our theme here, because um, I also like to have personal assistance and to be with my assistants all the, way, all, the, um, all the day, and it's very important that I have them. But it's also very important that I can be alone and be with my f only with my friends and um, just have time with them and letting the assistants go and then calling them later. Yes, now we can spend the, the, the time together. Yeah. And we, we were saying, I mean, Heidi, uh, that this is an incredibly popular story, actually. That there's a film in the 1920s, and uh, you know, and then all the way through. So this is something, this type of tale, but this one in particular, really appeals to children. It's all about children and, and, and them breaking the rules and making their world happen. But that's really typical, I think, of the sorts of stories that we grow up listening to, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I think so. It, it uh, poses a very strong picture on how to maybe deal with uh, a person with disabilities. But I would like to add on. I love how Heidi is dealing with Clara and that they're really building uh, a strong friendship. But on the other hand, for me, it's hard to have this. And the, the perfect ending is that Clara is able now to walk again. And that maybe an, a better ending would be if they just have their friendship and Clara is using a wheelchair and everyone is fine with it. That would be my perfect ending to it, or a possible ending to it. So you don't have to have the, the ending that everything is fine, and everything is fine only when no one has a disability. Yeah, yeah I strongly agree with this. And um, yeah, I would also say that, um, that it could also be the ending that Clara is, of course, it, it, it's, it's true that, some, that sometimes um, a person who, is a, who has a physical disability has the possibility to work in, in, in her life, but only with assistance or, or whatever. Um, but I think that's a different ending, that, that she's maybe, um, um, po it's maybe possible for her to work a little bit, but then also the using the wheelchair for other situations. But just to have this feeling that, yeah, if you, if you strongly believe in your in your will and in the support of your friends and assistants and family, then you can make proper steps into the more uh, independency with physical possibilities that you've never had before. But um, for me, this could be also a good a good ending that they really developed together some processes and other adventures and. Um, we say the, the reason it ends that way is because the arc needs to finish with this happy ending, and the happy, in this case, as is defined in one way. It, that, that, what you've described is too complicated for a fairy tale. Isn't it? This happened, but only this happened, and then that happened, but this didn't happen. That, that's the yeah. problem with those stories. They have to end in a nice, neat, packaged way. Um, and then when we look at the endings, um, 
and we talk about the, the norms and other things. There's a question here about how, do, you know, how does that story uh, come back in and tell us more about um, what people think of disabled people? Because that, that's part of the way that Clara is treated by her parents, but also by the people around her. That's part of what you're learning in there, isn't it? That there's a difference, even more so probably with Quasimodo in the, in the Hunchback and, and that sort of, uh, uh, the way that people uh, uh, step back from him and, and are scared of him even though he, he, he's not a threat to them. But that's, I think, the point, isn't it, as well, about those are the norms that are, that are embedded in there. And I'm guessing that's part of the, the, the inclusive storytelling that you're pushing back on those norms. Um, yes, and when you have to think when you think of the situation, you are a child and you are hearing these kind of stories for the first time and they are somehow there to shape your view on what is normal and uh, how is the societal view on, on aspects uh, like disability. So that's what you learn. You learn that uh, a happy end is a happy end when nobody has a disability. And um, when we look at people with disabilities, they have the role of villains or uh, they have the role that they are very poor and they have to be treated and that there is a, a problem which needs to be solved with them. The problem is, is around them because they have a disability. And um, I, what, what type of um, good and inclusive stories do you remember are, as an alternative? This is off again. Um, do you remember stories that actually aren't like that? Are there any examples you can think of? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> um, I, I thought about that question. So are there stories uh, which are inclusive? And then I thought about, um, I now have quite a few Barbies who are Barbies with disabilities. Okay. So I think <laughs> if I would have a child or if I... Um, would be a child right now, I would work out with those Barbies an inclusive story, an inclusive fairy tale where she is a wheelchair user or she has hearing aids. And I think those kind of fairy tales, they still have to be made. And in some uh, point of views, uh, the hunchback of Notre Dame is seen as, as very progressive. But for me, I don't really agree with that because when you look at the ending, um, he is liked. Uh, at the end with all the people in, in Paris, but on the other hand, who gets the women? The, women, the, the prince, the perfect blonde prince uh, is, is the goal for Esmeralda and they are together, but he can be happy because no one uh, is hating him anymore. Mm. So there, you can have many different views on those kind of stories. But when I researched about fairy tales, interesting was that when you look at the Grimm's brothers fairy tales, the, they are seen as, as quite progressive even though they are uh, from the 1800s because they have um, people with disabilities portrayed in, in a variety of ways and that their happy endings, not, not the real thing, there are not many happy endings in the original stories, but Disney made it simple and clear and an inclusive society is not simple and clear. And inclusive stories are not simple and easy and have like one model they are following. Mm. And do you have examples, Hella, from stories that you think of, were, I mean, you, you enjoyed Heidi, as you said. Were there other examples that you remember now from your childhood? I enjoyed it as a, as a little girl. Yeah. I don't know if I would enjoy it today. No, no. <laughs> with this thinking of it. Um, um, but, um, I think there are a couple of couple of children's stories now where where persons with disabilities, mostly wheelchair drivers, are are engaged with. Um, 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 I remember like like there is I, I don't remember the title, but there are some adventure. There is one adventure story where it's also um, it's called in Germany TKKG, and there's there's one person who is not, uh, is having a disability because it's really, um, um, has a, a big weight and um, he's bullying for, it, for this also. Um, but I have the feeling that now we more and more try to, try to make more inclusive stories, but I doubt if it's really inclusive because whenever I'm reading or, or seeing uh, films on it, it's just that there are persons with disabilities actors in the film and in the stories, 
but it's not absolutely that they were also they, that they have also a voice that they really participate in the story and have being a main character character being changing it's more that they are really that they are in there for being inclusive somehow but not um, but not as a real um, changing actor. There is now in the media, when you're looking at the German tele television, there is one, uh, one, uh, one man in, uh, with a disability who's really, who's really great, um, having a more serious um, uh, character um, um, place in, in, the in, the t in the television. Um, but I think this is the first time ever since I don't know many years <laughs> that we have um, this uh, kind of kind of man, and I think this is only the television. We also should look at the other um, um, at stories, um, or also at, at at apps, because we don't know if the children if, if the children are reading anymore, or if they really w would like to to see um, films or mm. comics or whatever. And we really have to change it here and to to change the norm that they really have the voice and um, that they're really participating. It's interesting you mentioned comics. There's a, there's a comment on here. Comics, uh, this is from somebody who's dropped it in. <laughs> I was a sickly child, so I was drawn to fantasy stories of dragons and magic. I like the idea that a person could use more than their body to overcome monsters. So endings where magic that comes from the mind always attracted me. Uh, but this is the particular thing linking to what you said. Comics are like modern fairy tales, and I always related to X-Men because they had genetic differences that, so this, this is very easy to read on here, that gave them special powers, but were also shunned by society. I wish they had more impairments as a result of their uh, superpowers, though, to better represent the ups and downs of having a disability. So those comics, you, you know, the, as you're saying, in different forms, we're thinking of fairy tales, but you think of comics and the fantasy element of that, then obviously that's um, a, a way of challenging it as well, isn't it? Uh, I love how this comment on Slido just highlighted that I think now we have a much bigger wish for complexity in stories than um, we had when the Disney movies or when you look at the Disney movies. So I think inclusive storytelling is uh, being more complex and viewing uh, people as complex as they are. Yeah. And do you think that, I mean, certainly film and other things have changed, Disney being the 50s, the height of those stories, they changed the endings of those fairy tales that we're used to in several cases, The Little Mermaid being a really famous example that was a tragedy that became, uh, well, there's, there's a suggestion in here that what, what um, where is it in here? Uh, somebody suggested an alternative ending. The Little Mermaid, Eric could have learned sign language. <laughs> and then the, then the ending yeah. would have been completely different. Yeah. But when we look at endings, uh, when you look at the Hunchback of Notre Dame, there are many endings because I researched the ending uh, of uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame and there is the Disney ending where Esmeralda gets the beautiful prince and uh, Quasimodo is liked by the community. But there is the original book ending where um, everyone dies and in the end uh, Quasimodo and Esmeralda are laying in the cemetery together as, uh, and only the bones, so the last picture is the bones of Esmeralda and uh, Quasimodo are intertwined. Cool. Quite dark, I agree, not suitable for the Disney movie, but um, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's better, I think. It's better than the ending <laughs> that Esmeralda gets this boring, um, not prince, but what is he, a soldier? Well. <laughs> So he's not the one you wanted. Okay. Well, I would so also, could I add? Yeah, could please I add do, yes. Time? So I would also say that if we are looking at the modern stories that we are now reading and uh, looking and hearing to, um, is that often we have also novels and uh, fairy tales. We have fairy tale, I don't know, but uh, we, have, uh, we have often stories where they are open endings. And I think this, when, when we like having a story with open ending and then we have also a story where there are characters with different disabilities and then an open ending, this also for children, for children in children's book, for me this would be the, this would be a good solution because then the, the child is perhaps thinking more about it after reading it and 
it's perhaps changing her perspective so um, because because the children are learning when they are when they are just looking and when they have the time to think about something um, perhaps my cousin one day wanted me to 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 help me that I that I be not that um, not that crumbled with my uh, uh, vertebral but more but more stable and uh, direct and he wanted to he wanted to bring me to a, to a tree and just stand me up there and then bring and then came came to me next morning in order to uh, bring me back in the wheelchair and he said yeah Helen and then you will be in a normal normal way as I am and um, yeah that that was just after one conversation with him which were only lasting like one minute and he was only like looking at me and had his own fantasy how he could change the situation yeah, yeah, yeah. not knowing that this uh, possibility he has in mind w won't function in the real world but this is how um, children are yeah. are learning and thinking and I think this for me this could be an Good, good solution with open endings. So I've got a, a suggested ending here, which I really like because of where we are in the conference we're in, which is that um, the fairy tale ending for uh, the alternative ending for Heidi would be Clara gets assist assistive technology, which allows her to move better and live independently in the Swiss Alps, uh, so that she could take part everywhere like the normal people. So that's a, that's a modern <laughs> ending in terms of using the assistive technology as the solution, you know, the, the change in the story rather than the magical she got up and walked away. And, but maybe they don't yeah. have power up in but the Alps, yeah. and then you have the wonderful technology, but it's <laughs> exactly. not working. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Or you, you cannot make an update because the internet connection is uh, bad. Yeah. Yeah. So I love assistive technology, but... <laughs> yeah, it's got its place. Yeah. So a final question, I, I, I think this is just generally, whether you think it's better to change the ending, or maybe it's better to change the, the, the setting, the question is... Um, uh, is it better to change the ending or to add framing to explain it? I, I, so what you were starting to say, I think, Manhella, was that ma let people understand that the world is more complicated than a fairy tale. Let them understand that when they're young and open-ended mm -hmm, stories. Exactly. You, you suggest that rather than change the ending to make it happy or sad, you just say, no, put, put it in a different context and, and, and explain some of the complexity behind it. I don't know whether that's the sort of approach that you take in the work you're doing around inclusive storytelling as well, where you're giving people the freedom to make the rules up within the stories without using classical fairy tale structure of, you know, there has to be a happy ending. So if Disney is calling me about a new adaption <laughs> of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, yeah, we would talk about many things, I think. You can show um, what the situation was back then, where it played in the 1800s, but you, you maybe can um, change the ending as well, but change how it's going to be portrayed. And especially um, not long ago, I was in the musical to The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, which has another ending. And the ending there is that he, the, the, the player who has no disability, of course, he loses all the features showing his disability, the hunchback and the, he's not tilted anymore. And in the end, he flies up to heaven, but he is able-bodied. So that, that was hard for me, but everyone around me, everyone around me clapped and was excited and delighted about the musical, such a strong story, and now he's healed and everything is fine. And for me, it was a, a really, really bad ableist experience, sitting there and not really clapping about it. And I would love to see an adaptation, an informed adaptation of this story, so that I can enjoy the music as well, because the choir was really nice. <laughs> Great. So um, we've run out of time. Um, I'm going to um, jump off on that one. Uh, I'm just going to mention um, a couple of sources. When we, um, when we were coming up with this idea, I did it with Isabella, um, and then these guys kindly agreed to get involved. There's a couple of really obvious places. If this sounds interesting and you hadn't thought about fairy tales and storytelling before, we, we didn't think this up. There's plenty of research out there. There's a book um, called Disfigured about fairy tales, disability, and making space. Uh, from uh, an author in Toronto. Uh, you can obviously go and read the, the books themselves. And then if you 
type in disability and fairy tales into, into Google, you'll find all sorts of um, resources and ideas, and particularly stories about how to change the endings and challenge some of these um, ableist uh, sort of tropes and stereotypes that, that we almost don't notice after a while. I think that's the whole point. And thinking about it particularly with children and how the stories we talk to them uh, tell them contain all of these elements and what we can do to push back on that but also just taking control of the stories and telling our own stories in a different way. So I just want to say a huge thank you to both Heidi and Hella who've agreed to, to be part of this and share their experiences and, and, and knowledge around these stories. Um, so thank you very much and thank you all for, for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, I'm all right. Microphone, may I? Yeah.